Welcome back to Information Technology Fundamentals. This lecture is going to cover uh, using data types and the different units that are associated with them. We're going to start off by looking at the different notational systems, uh, data types, and units of measure that are used in computers. Then we're going to uh, compare and contrast uh, fundamental data types uh, and their characteristics that computers use. And then we're going to discuss the importance of data and ways that companies can use to make business decisions. We're going to start off talking about notational systems. And we'll talk uh, start with the decimal notation system, which is what we're all used to using. Uh, and in this uh, quick example here on the screen, we can see that uh, when we dive into how this number which the number we're looking at here is 12, is set up, we can see that we have uh, placeholders. And the placeholders are designated by base 10, which is decimal, and an exponent. So 10 to the 0 is the 1's placeholder, 10 to the 1 is the 10's, 10 to the 2 is the 100's, and 10 to the 3 is the 1,000th. So when we put 12 in here, we calculate that we have 110, and when we put a 2 in the uh, ones column, then we have two ones. So 10 plus 2 equals 12. And that's how we, we come to a, a decimal notation. While computers don't use a decimal notation, they actually use binary notation. So ones or zeros. Probably heard of that many times over the years when we talk about computers that everything is a one or a zero on or off. And it has to do with how transition transistors work in the uh, motherboard and in the processor. So in this example, uh, uh, all computers change all numbers into a binary number. And in fact, they change all data into a binary number of some sort. So everything that happens in a computer is binary. So in this example, we're taking the number 51 and we're going to find its binary representation. So just like we did with the decimals, we start at the top where we have 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, all the way to 2 to the 7th. So we have the base 2 and the exponents. And on the column underneath, I put what the exponent value is. So 2 to the 0 is 1, all the way to 2 to the 7th is 128. Now, if we take the binary number 110011 and we put it in this table, we can see that we have 1, 2 to the 5th, 1, 2 to the 4th. And if we calculate what those are, of course, that's the number 32 in base 10 and the number 16. We have no 8s, no 4s, a 2 and a 1. So when we add 32 plus 16 plus 2 plus 1, we get 51. So 51 in decimal turns out to be 110011. Now, as we go through this, this chart or this table I'm showing you here is really important in the future uh, IT classes you're going to take because it's used over and over again, especially in IP addresses, use this exact same table to represent their network and host names. So you'll see this again. I'd also draw your attention to 2 to the 4th, which is 16. And we're going to look at hexadecimal in a second. And hexadecimal means base 16, which is directly related here to binary. If we think about decimal, which is a 10, and you look at this uh, binary uh, notational table, you'll see that there is not an even representation of 10, but there is of 16, which is why we use it in computers. So let's look at hexadecimal. So it's a base 16, and after we get to the letter or to the number nine, the next number is A, B, C, D, E, F. And F is going to be 15, right? So 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 are represented by letters. Now, each column is going to be uh, a different power of 16. So down here, just like we had before, we have base 16, and then we have the exponents 0 th to 3. 
But notice how much faster these grow. So we have a column of 1s, then a column of 16s, a column of 256, and a column of 4096. Well, what this means for us and why we use it in the computer world is because we can make a very long binary number. We can represent it quickly with a much shorter hexadecimal number. So in this case, we've got a decimal number of 4,703. The hexadecimal representation is 125F. So if we look down here, just like we did before, we've got 1, 4,096. We've got two 512s, five 16s, and 15 ones. And when we add those together, we get 4,703. So that is how hexadecimal works. So let's dive into the bits and bytes of the computer world. So a bit is a single binary digit, either a one or a zero. And a byte has eight bits in it. If you remember back to that table I showed you, it had eight eight uh, entries in it, two to the zero to two to the seventh. That's going to be a byte. Um, we use a base 10 multiple of bytes to represent different sizes of files and storage. We've seen kilobyte, megabyte, gigabyte, uh, terabyte, petabyte. Uh, so those are representations of storage sizes. But the reality is that our storage, our hard drives, our solid state drives are actually stored in base two. They have to be because everything is binary. So while up here we talk about a kilobyte, uh, the reality is if we bought something that was a kilobyte, it would actually be 1024 or two to the 10th. So we have a little mismatch in how we describe storage and sizes, um, but uh, the, the kilobyte through petabyte are rough estimates. If you want to know exactly the size, you would have to look at the kibibyte, mebibyte, or gibibyte. Now we'll switch gears and look at transfer rates or speeds or throughput, whatever you want to call it. And they're going to be represented with many of the same sounding uh, units. Here we have kilobytes, which would be a thousand bits per second, megabytes, a million bits, gigabytes, terabytes. Uh, and these will always be base 10 and there's uh, no kind of crossover like we saw with storage. And of course, we're all looking to get gigabyte service internet service at our house, right? The processor, on the other hand, has a few, uh, uh, another designation, which is the time cycle given in hertz. One hertz is one cycle per second. And in the original CPUs, that mean it carried out one instruction per second. So if we look at the clock sp uh, speed per second, that gives us a rough indication of how much work a processor is doing. Uh, typically, we'll see right now that uh, most processors are given in gigahertz or 1,000 million cycles per second. But one of the big changes in CPUs is allowing them to do more than one instruction bit per cycle, which, of course, would greatly increase their, uh, their work. In the computer, we've got... Um, several different data types that we need to be aware of and that are referenced both in programming and how things are stored elsewhere on the computer. Uh, so first, let's talk about uh, numbers. We have integers and floating point numbers. Integers are whole numbers. They don't have anything after the decimal point. And floating point number are decimals. The reason why we differentiate these in the computer is the amount of room that's required to store an integer is quite a bit different than the amount of room needed to store a floating point number. So that's why we make a differentiation between the two. And then we have Boolean values, which is actually the smallest data type we can have, and that's either a one or a zero, so it just takes up one bit. And then we have characters, single characters such as an A sitting all by itself. Uh, on an upcoming slide, we'll look at how those are stored in a little more detail. And, and then we have a string, which is a bunch of characters uh, or a collection of text characters stored together at once. So here on this slide, we're looking at how characters are stored. And in particular, you'll see on the right side of the screen, we have the ASCII um, table of all the numbers and representations. Now, if we recall, a computer is going to store everything as ones and zeros or numbers. 
So the as key is showing us the binary number associated with each of the uh, letters in the alphabet. And we can look on here and we can, if, for example, if we wanted to find the letter A, it's over here. It's a decimal number is 65. And here is the binary representation, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And then if you look at B, it's the next one up and so on and so forth. So, forth. Uh, so ASCII is used frequently. However, Unicode is a more flexible system that gives us uh, international alphabets and a lot more characters that are possible to be used. For companies, data is an asset. Maybe we would even call it intellectual property. So they must invest in security to uh, make sure that their, their data is not stolen or otherwise uh, compromised. So when we think about security, we'll, we'll look at data through a lens of what we call CIA, which means confidentiality. No one else can see it. Integrity. Nobody can change it who's not supposed to. And availability. Who has access, the people that have access to it have access to it. So they'll make, uh, they'll look through that lens and determine what, controls they're going to deploy to protect the assets. Uh, they'll also use that to predict a return on security investment. Should we spend the money to protect it? How much money should we spend? And along with this, we're always looking at a risk assessment to determine if what we're doing is working or if we need to do something else. So what are some of the security controls we can put in place? Well, many of you have heard of uh, most of these. Back up our data. Make sure that uh, that we have a backup. Typically, we'll hear something called a 321 idea, which is three copies of the data, one off-site and two on-site. Then to protect the data, we're going to control who has access to it through permissage, uh, permissions, usage restriction, the use of uh, encryption, and the use of firewalls. And lastly, we want to make sure our network is robust enough so that uh, our data has high availability to those people that need to use it. Along with our uh, data, uh, most of it will be classified as intellectual property. We'll frequently hear it uh, abbreviated as IP. We have copyright, which are things like uh, in the computer world, programming, books, um, videos, audio. It's automatically granted to the author when you make something. It applies to the work. A trademark, on the other hand, is, for example, the name and logo of a company. Uh, companies apply to register their trademarks. Copyright happens automatically. And then we have a patent, which is an idea. Typically, we think of it an invention. It's got to be original, useful, distinctive. Uh, you have to apply for it in different jurisdictions. So if you have a patent in the United States, it may not matter at all over in Europe. And digital rights management is the idea of uh, keeping copyrighted work. Uh, so music is a classic example of that. I buy a piece of music and the person who created it may or may not want me to share it with the whole world. So one of the tools they use to make sure that if I buy it, I'm the only one using it is called digital rights management. It also uh, occurs with movies and um, audio books and some other things like that. Right now, uh, data-driven business decisions is uh, a big topic. It really just means that before business makes a decision, they want to gather as much information as possible and decide what they're going to do based on that. Uh, it's really a little bit of a new field because when I say new, I'd say in the last 20 years, because now we collect such a much uh, a much larger data set on everything we do, which gives uh, businesses an opportunity to analyze in a lot more detail that what's happening at their business and make decisions based on that. This is called uh, data analytics, and with it looks at the relationship of data to the information. It collects all the raw data and it requires data analytics, someone to uh, determine what's the important parts of the data and which are not, which ones do we want to use to make a decision. 
Um, it also, data analytics means we're summarizing all the different data points, we're making charts, and we're trying to, as a business, find insights that are meaningful and help us make good business decisions. So to make a, a data-driven business decision, we have to look at what data we're capturing, make sure we're capturing and collecting the correct one, uh, correct set of data. We have to make uh, correlations between the different pieces of data, and we have to have some type of meaningful reporting so that when we look at it, we can interpret what's happening easily. So in this uh, lecture, we looked at the different types of notation systems, data types, and units of measure. We looked at the fundamental data types that are used in computers and the importance of data and how companies utilize it to make good business decisions.